we lived a mile from the nearest road. You had to walk to our house and we had to stack, you know, split and stack 12, 13, 14 cords of wood a year. We had only wood burning stove and it's cold as shit in New Hampshire. And, <laughs> um, you know, you had to pull a sled up that path home with groceries in it or whatever. And I was the oldest boy, um, you know, I, doing maple sugaring with my dad, you know, carrying buckets, you know, of sap. They're just a metal, metal, you know, little handle. Yeah. And the buckets are heavy as shit. And like you have to carry them, you know, 500 yards sometimes. Um, so just lots of little things that I was doing naturally where in my head I realized like if I'm just thinking about carrying this bucket, it doesn't, it sucks. Like this just blows. If I had to walk from the bottom of my, you know, where our tennis camp was up to my house and it's, you know, 430 at night in the evening, in the winter, it's dark, you know, no flashlight. And I'd get scared. I'd get psyched out. And I'd, you know, so I'd start telling myself little mental stories. I'd pretend like I was a hero or, you know, that I was protecting somebody. And that just became a natural routine for me is adjusting my, my brain with whatever. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Mountain Tough Podcast. We are so glad that you are here and we love seeing you all come back week after week to work on your mindset, to work on your mental toughness. It is our goal to continue to bring you inspiring guests that motivate you and create a new way of thinking based on their inspiration. We love seeing you guys here week after week. And thanks for making us one of the top mental toughness podcasts in the country. If you haven't already, please leave us a review after listening to these episodes in the app store of your choice, in the podcast store of your choice. Now, diving into Mountain Tough, there's been a lot going on around here in the month of September. Archery elk season is in full swing. A lot of guys are out in the hills chasing elk with their bows. It's an awesome time of year. And in the lab, we have been pushing the limits on a couple different things. One of those things is the kettle, is the Sandbag 20 program. So a Sandbag program that we partnered with GORUCK on four weeks long. And there is nothing quite like Sandbag training. So if you're looking for something new and different, make sure you check out Sandbag 20 in the app. Now, if you haven't dove into the app before, all you need to do is download that from the app store for all your physical and mental training needs. And remember, you can start on that 14-day free trial. Switching gears to today's episode, today I had the chance to sit down with Bodie Miller. Bodie Miller was one of the most fascinating conversations and podcasts we've had yet on this show Bodhi is a world champion skier and has a mindset that is unlike anything that we've really heard before on this show. So he wasn't quite um, naturally talented or gifted as a kid in skiing, but through his own coaching and self-coaching and problem solving and really the way he was able to conquer his mind and his thoughts and his emotions He was able to become one of the best in the world. And not only has he used that concept for skiing, but he's using that for overcoming adversity in business and in life as well. He has a phenomenal business that he is starting up here in Bozeman Peak Skis, and he's trying to revolutionize the ski industry. And he's been through some crazy adversity in life as well with a large family and many children. He has also lost a child, and he talks a little bit about that today in this show and how creating this resilient mindset helped helped him get through one of the most uh, difficult traumas there is in life. So certainly a show you're not going to want to miss, so stand by as we dive into our conversation. And then my goal today was really to talk as much as possible about your mindset and kind of how you've developed your mindset over the years from youth until now and how that's helped you like overcome a lot of obstacles, be a world champion, um, get through adversity and maybe how your mindset has changed and how you think about that. The one reason I want to focus on that is 
Mountain Tough is a big mental toughness brand, so we do a lot of the fitness programming for sure, but we also have a huge focus on mindset and mental toughness. So we're big believers in that the mental toughness most of the time can trump the physical fitness of whoever we're working with. Mm -hmm. And so if we can't get their mindset to a level it needs to be, we need to focus on that first before the physical side of the program. So often the, often those two overlap so significantly that it's not like a first and second, but you need to focus on it. Yeah. Uh, even during the physical stuff, right? Like, cause typically you can do some therapy sessions or whatever <laughs> you know, want to do, but tying it into physical work or activity or whatever it is often gives it a cleaner path into like having an impact, you know, yeah. like where you're working on your, your sort of, whether it's resilience or tolerance for discomfort or just like more like we were talking about where it's actually the messaging you want to increase the think of it like a drainage tube of energy or information that comes through the nerve isn't going to get bigger but the information that goes through it can be much more important and powerful and that's that comes from the mental side of it so mm -hmm. I mean, i'm 100 percent in agreement but often yeah those two overlap so dramatically we deal with that all the time I mean, yeah it's, it's the main challenge in in skiing yeah, and physical pain has to be one of the best tools to change someone's mindset. It's hard to be extremely mentally tough or help someone become more mentally tough if you're not putting them through some sort of trauma. So yeah, whatever the stress profile is, it's got to be there. It can be it can be other stuff, but I like I think the phys physical element is the most logical, easiest and universally accepted like the way we evolved we're designed that way mm -hmm. you know that you your mental state is directly impacted by physical yeah demands and stress like backing backing way up to when in your childhood and your youth do you think you had a lot of that competitive nature built into you at an early age um yeah i mean it's it's weird for me because like I'm, it's presumed that I'm hyper competitive. I'm actually not. I really don't care. I think that came through in bits and pieces throughout my career. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly people who know me really well can see it, but it doesn't really ever click all the way in where it makes sense because I tend to win at stuff. I, I, I try really hard. I like to try hard, but that's just for the sake of trying hard and putting in maximum effort. It really doesn't like if I'm trying really hard and it's clear that I'm going to win, I don't ever let up on the trying hard, right? Which would be an indicator that it's all about winning. In this case, it's the opposite. And people would say, oh, well, when you're not going to win and you keep trying hard, maybe you still think you're going to win. There's no confusion there. There's been lots of races where I've been, I've hiked, like there's no way I'm winning. <laughs> there's no mm -hmm. way anything productive is actually coming out of a race and I'll still go 100% maximum. It's just more, that was there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think I, I grew up, you know, in a sort of an unusual way with really mellow hippie parents, my dad and mom, you know, off the grid, no electricity, no running water um, in New Hampshire and homeschooled. And I had tons of freedom and chance to spend time outdoors and just hang out by the river and track animals and screw around. And um, I think when you do that, as opposed to a formal school, you, you develop more of an alpha or a, you know beta personality pretty early just because sure. there's kids who are bigger more dominant or whatever whatever your personality trait is when you're by yourself in nature you become more i would say um i would say humble in a way like you there is no like you, i'd go out and you know i'd leave the house at you know i got light 7 30 in the morning seven in the morning and when I was three, four years old and I wouldn't come back till after lunch. And my mom would be like, sometimes I think she would follow me or you know, <laughs> track me just to make sure I didn't go too far. But I think she got really confident that I was careful. And I think she liked the idea that I was that because she wasn't always there, you know, mm -hmm. like it's a chicken or the egg. Like you can't develop that if somebody's always watching over you, making sure that you're not hurting yourself. Like I, you know, I fall and, fall in the river and hit my head on a rock. And like, though that can kill a kid, you know, you can drown in an inch of water if you get knocked out. Um, and, but I, I, I got through it and because I wasn't supervised all the time, I got that sort of natural 
risk management and self-reliance. And I think then once I went to public school, I was sort of not so connected to the, like the hierarchies or competitive yeah. nature. Or I sort of, um, was always kind of on my own program a bit, but when it came to sports and competition, I always tried as hard as I could. It didn't matter that we were on lousy teams a lot of the time. Um, I just, that's what I like to do. I figured why not? Like it was, it was so much more fun to be putting in maximum effort than, than tanking, <laughs> sandbagging it. You know, it just, it was pretty obvious to me. I could see people who would get discouraged and it just looked like they were unhappy. And even if I was losing, I was still going ape shit, you know, mm -hmm. um, there was easily ways to figure out how to still have fun and doing stuff without being hyper-focused on the outcome. Um, and that, that sort of permeated everything I did from then forward. And, you know, I got in a bunch of shit for saying I didn't really care about results when you're in the Olympics and all that matters is results <laughs> yeah. to people's mind. But the reality is it's not, I mean, it's, it's one of those crazy social, um, anomalies that people think that it's all about the medal, but yet you watch the Paralympics or you watch somebody who overcomes more and they don't win, but it's more meaningful in a lot of ways than, the, than watching Usain Bolt. You know, he was incredible to watch cause he was just so fast, but it was almost a, a drop kick for him. Like he was, you know, yeah. showboating for the last 15 yards when he wins and breaks the world record. Like There's that no was story. different than watching somebody who really is, maxing out and giving it everything and the stories there and they're overcoming maybe not as much natural talent or more obstacles i think that resonates more with people the average person because who out of the you know 300 million people we have in the u.s who can really relate to being able to run up past the speed limit <laughs> in a, yeah. you know like it doesn't really make sense it's cool to watch but seeing the real thing and somebody overcoming stuff resonates i think in a better way so I mean, it was, I was incredibly popular in Europe and the U S but that part pissed people off when I said I didn't really, it wasn't that I didn't care. It was that I was willing to deal with it if it didn't work out mm -hmm. and that, that upset people. And, and then I also had some missteps in my, <laughs> in the way I articulated that message because over the course of 15 years, it gets frustrating to have people continually try to get an answer out of you. That's not the fucking answer, you they know, want a different answer. Yeah. And you know, I just stay with what I was saying and you answer the same thing. 3,000 times and it gets annoying and you end up being like, you know what? I do not give a shit <laughs> what you say. And you're like, oops, that's how, on record now. How did this play out, The your unique upbringing, when you started skiing for the first time with a coach? Was it difficult to like work with a coach and go through your technique or was that different than some of the other kids? Yeah, it was definitely different. It wasn't. It wasn't hard for me. It was hard for them. Um, but it was also like, I, I decided that I wanted to be a skier when I was seven. Um, that was 1984, the Olympics and Mayor brothers medaled and Bill Johnson medaled. And I was watching it on a VHS tape. I watched it over and over and asked my grandmother and was like, how do you do it? And, um, what's the process? And she was a elite level skier as well. And really solid, just really good at communicating and walked me through it and was like, they were just little kids like you. They aren't born with anything magical. It's just they stay with it. They have the requisite skills or body type or whatever, but it's more a battle of like attrition or stubbornness or determination than anything else. Like most things, like if you, if you had the mental capacity and, you know, to stay with something determinedly, you can change your body type. You can change all sorts of things. Um, and nothing really happens until you're 20 anyway. And, you know, she's like, you're seven. You have a bunch of time. Yeah, nothing really matters right now, like that way. You, but in terms of you win a race tomorrow, you win a race next year. It doesn't. You're not going to make money. It doesn't mean you're in the Olympics. You can be the best when you're 12 or 15. You need to be thinking like, how do I get to a point where I'm able to compete with the best guys in the world when I'm 20 or 25 or 30? And dang, that kind of stuck with me. And I, I think that made it particularly difficult for coaches because they were like, you need to do this or that, and. I'd identified that I had really good natural um, awareness of fall line and, and how to sort of make speed and see speed and cut line off where other guys weren't, take risk where I thought it made sense. And um, I had an incredible volume of skiing when I was really young because I was homeschooled. So I was skiing every day. The mountain was open. Um, I'd get, you know, ride up from workers and ride down from workers. 
and just ski all day. So I kind of just developed a natural feel for it, but my technique was garbage and mm-hmm. that pissed my coaches off because they wanted you to look a certain way. And I was like, that's, that would be fine if it wasn't going to screw up the part that I actually have good right now. Like technique is not going to win me <laughs> races <laughs> against Europeans. That's yeah. just common sense. Even at that age. I mean, granted, I grew up in a, in a family that had raced in collegiate level and pro. Um, so I had like people who could, you know, talk to me about it and more of my uncles talked to me in terms of how impossible it was. I mean, I didn't have a lot of like positive. Yeah. Real like, yeah, that this is likely <laughs> it was like, you have zero chance of doing this. And I was like, well, maybe, but I don't think so. I, I thought that I could do it the whole time. So for coaches, I think it was really frustrating to have a really, I was like, I am now like when I was that age, I just, I didn't get upset and I didn't yell and I just talked to him like a adult really. But They were like, you need to do this shit with your technique. And I was like, that I've tried it. I try it right now, but it makes me slower. And they're like, yeah, but it's going to make you faster in the long run. I say, I don't think so. I think it's going to actually impede. If once you lose the feel of speed or how to like make speed, it's really hard to get back. And you've seen that for, Mm -hmm. I gave them examples of other athletes who look really good, but aren't fast and they can't find out how to go faster again. And I was like, the one thing I can't lose is my biggest strength right now. Like I'll, I'll get better. Like if you don't think my technique's going to get better, it's going to get better regardless of whether I focus on it right now or not. I'm just going to get bigger and stronger and slowly figure things out. But I have to keep growing the strength that I have because ultimately at the very top, you have to try to beat, you know, it's not tennis where there's one dude you got to beat at a time, you know, and your draw might be nice. It's like you got to beat everybody in the world, all the best people all at once. So you don't get, you you don't get any freebies. There's no, like, no pro racing is awesome. You come up against one guy, you're like, okay, I just got to beat this one guy, you know, and you can mess with them. You can, if you get ahead, they might panic. They might start to make mistakes or whatever. But when you're racing against everybody and you can't, you're not on the course with them. There's nothing you can do to impact their performance. There's nothing they can do to impact yours. You really have to have something that you can do better than everybody else. And that's a big ask in mm-hmm. any sport. You know, yeah. when you're talking about the best guys in the world all the time who have natural gifts that are, you know, span the spectrum. Um, and I had pretty big deficits I had to overcome as well, physically and, you know, equipment. Just being an American, it's, it's much worse to compete in a sport that's primarily based in Europe when you're an American. And, um, so yeah, I, I sort of just stuck with my philosophy and I think any anyone who's tried to coach a stubborn kid who especially one who doesn't get upset, like it's ultimately like probably the most frustrating <laughs> thing. Because yeah. I would just sit there and they'd be freaking out like, You're not gonna fucking race a single race this year. And I'd be like, All right, that's fine. Actually, this year doesn't matter much. I'm just talking calm. about when I'm twenty or twenty three. Like what you do right now, I'll have a different coach in a couple of years for you. Yeah. You you don't have any vested interest in me. Like you want something right now. I'm only talking about me. I don't give a shit about the other kids. Like, go fuck with them if you want to. Like, my, my, my deal is longer. So it's I insane think that you had was, that wisdom then. That was rough for them. I feel a little bit bad, but most of them were dicks anyway. So. <laughs> and then did eventually you kind of grow into your own technique as you got a little bit yeah, older? Yeah, I mean, I, was, I, I kept it was exactly like you'd think. I had in crazy raw speed like i could make two or three turns as fast as some world cup guys but then i'd blow out and then get back in and do it again and again and eventually equipment caught up i realized how important equipment was which is why you know i was um i built that k24 the first shape skis and uh, there's all kinds of pushback now because it's like elon says they were building it before i did it in europe but Either way, I didn't know what they were doing, and mm-hmm. I built it with K2. I sort of because I was a snowboarder, and I saw a side cut on, and I realized how important equipment was for me. Like if I got the right ski, even the right mounting position, the right tune on my skis, like it made not making mistakes so much easier. It made what I was trying to do so much easier. Whereas most kids just dealt with their equipment and just tried to maintain their technique and whatever speed their technique produced, they were happy with. They lived with, and I was that was not okay with me. So. Um, it sort of shifted my focus entirely to like just maximum speed and then figuring out what led to mistakes, how to eliminate those and then, um, get the fitness to some of it was fitness. Some of the mistakes were just simply, I wasn't strong enough or didn't Mm -hmm. have the endurance. They'd happen at the bottom of courses consistently. And I was good at picking up patterns and figuring out, um, you know, how to solve those 
incrementally and when you know you start off with a thousand thousand different problems and you solve them one at a time it takes a long time it's but, a lot but eventually you start seeing linked problems you can solve five at the same time and um, a lot of that was just like i said fitness i mean i was tall and skinny and skiing is such a demanding sport physically mm -hmm. um that i you know it took a while to sort of get that um to be within it's you don't have to be perfect you just have to be within a range right you just have to be strong enough and then you have to manage reverse engineer like okay i know i'm going to be sucking at the bottom because it's a long hard course and i'm just not fit enough so you can i could try to make more speed at the top if i thought it wasn't going to compound that at the bottom if i wasn't going to be burning up extra energy i could take wicked risk at the top but if i thought it was going to do that then i did pace myself and i did that throughout my whole career i just I had to constantly be managing tactics um, to sort of offset my weaknesses. And um, it was good. I mean, it gave me a lot to think about, as you can imagine, and a lot of like necessity driven um, evolution. Like my thought and my skill sets evolved because they had to more than other kids because of the path that I chose to take. And ultimately, that made it so that I didn't have a lot of the same barriers at the higher levels that they did. I had more barriers at a lower level, and I had to kind of like, stubborn my way through it mm -hmm. um where i could have made that a lot easier on myself had i just gone their route but then at the top there's all kinds of guys who just can't figure out how to do stuff because coach yeah because they haven't practiced it for forever and that made it much easier for me when i started getting into the real international high level stuff and i just didn't i didn't slow down at all in my first world cup i you know went from 69th to 11th and qualified for the olympics in my first first race and that was like no one could believe it except if you had seen me race the last 20 years. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> like I, I wasn't scared of the opportunity I, more than anything. I was like, all right, this is my chance. I got to stomp it now and like didn't back off at all. And everybody was freaking out after the first run because I was the only American to qualify for the second run. Crazy. And they were like, you got to just snow plow down. You'll get a World Cup point. And I was like, have you been watching any, <laughs> anything that I've been doing? I was like, I'm going Sending ape it. shit, dude. Like, and if I crash, I crash. Like, but I'm not gonna miss a chance to like to do it. And that's I think that's a that's a function of growing up the way that I did and like and having that ownership because if you don't have the ownership of it, it's really hard to make that choice. Like, you know, if that you're confidence. if it's your coaches, if it's your your, you know, your team, if it's everybody else who has ownership of your skill set and your if you've been constantly you know, being disenfranchised with your decisions and your tactics and everything else, that's an impossible decision to make. But you for me, have the it was, confidence. At yeah, all. you just don't have the ownership. Honestly, it feels mm -hmm. like their decision is your decision. You just get used to it, you know? And I think that's, yeah, that was a huge, huge thing for me. At what point in your career did the concept of your mindset and mental toughness come into play? Did you start focusing on that at a given point uh, i mean it was a natural component right from birth probably but really early i would say like three four or five years old because i had to, we lived a mile from the nearest road you had to walk to our house and we had to stack you know split and stack 12 13 14 cords of wood a year we had only wood burning stove and it's cold as shit in new hampshire and <laughs> um you know, you had to pull a sled up that path home with groceries in it or whatever. And I was the oldest boy, um, you know, I, doing maple sugaring with my dad, you know, carrying buckets, you know, of sap. They're just a metal, metal, you know, little handle. Yeah. And the buckets are heavy as shit. And like you have to carry them, you know, 500 yards sometimes. Um, so just lots of little things that I was doing naturally where in my head I realized like if I'm just thinking about carrying this bucket, it doesn't it sucks. Like this just blows. If I had to walk from the bottom of my, you know, where our tennis camp was up to my house and it's, you know, four thirty at night in the evening, in the winter, it's dark, you know, no flashlight. And I'd get scared. I'd get psyched out. And I'd, you know, so I'd start telling myself little mental stories. I'd pretend like I was a hero or, you know, that I was protecting somebody and that just became a natural routine for me is adjusting my, my brain with whatever, because in there, yep. it's, you know, reality is we're, we're surrounded by danger all the time. I mean, we don't recognize it very well. We're particularly, um, dumb right now, maybe more so than ever before in mm -hmm. evolutionary history about 
where what's dangerous versus what's scary, where is actual fear required or appropriate, and where is it just a byproduct of being, you know, disillusioned or whatever else. And I think it was when you're little, you have fears about random stuff that's probably not real, but you realize if you're if you're put in those situations over and over and over again, you realize that you can change it really easily. Like mm-hmm. as soon as your mindset changes, the fear changes. There, it wasn't, if I was faced with a bear, which would happen lots of times, you know, you come walking up the path, just kind of mumbling along, like not thinking. And then you look up and there's a bear in front of you. Yeah. You're like, then there's a moment of like, okay, this is actually real. Real (laughs) fear. Yeah. There's, there's danger here. But ironically in that situation, you're not really that scared. It's kind of like deal with the situation. It's, it's right in front of you and you're either somewhat prepared for it or not at all. In this case, I was prepared for it because I'd grown up. That was my whole life. So I just, you know, talk, talk to the bear, (laughs) back up, you know, (laughs) not run like all the basic stuff. And it wasn't hard to manage because I was born into it. But when you deal with, you know, watching Friday the 13th for the first time and you're, you know, I was probably four years old, you know, some evil (laughs) cousin or something showed it to me. And that was like a fake fear, but super duper scary, right? Like, especially growing up at a tennis camp, like it's like the scenario couldn't be better. You're in the woods all the time. It's like (laughs) your worst fear is that you're running as fast as you can. And somebody who's walking is catching up to you. Like that's like everybody's like nightmare that they have. And, um, you know, I'd have the, I'd have those type of moments where I'd be walking through the woods and then I'd try to logic my way out of it, but that never really worked. I'd be like, okay, look, that's a movie. It's fake. Like it's a big woods, like. There's not some dude walking behind me, but your mind is particularly pre-designed to feed on fears that way. I think it's a survival instinct of some sort and like it just continually goes. So really early I realized like I needed to put it in a different place. I needed to manipulate my mind and to like not, even if there was somebody behind me, even if my mind was strong enough to, to continually recycle that annoying fear, it was like I was this badass little, you know, ninja. I just imagined that I would just kick the shit out of him, not like in the movies, you know, yeah. like I would do some awesome thing. And then like before you'd know it, I'd be walking up my steps into my house. And that was so early that I think it really became a, a part of what we already talked about, about not quitting. And it, it didn't really matter. I just put my head in a different place. I didn't, I wasn't encumbered by the reality of the situation I was in. I could, I could be competing in some, you know, dinky little softball game. And, and in my mind, I was, it was the world series or it was, it was a international game that determined <laughs> the fate of our country or, you and know, you're gonna go all anything out. else. Yeah. And I could get a totally different physiological response out of my body because of that too. Cause if you get good at it, you're method acting in a way that makes it just as real as if it was actually a hundred percent real. So, and that never created a scenario where it was like, um, competition fear on big race day where like the world championship was too intense too much pressure too big no no because if you're if you're saving your sister from a burning building or you know and some of them were were based on real things i would just modify them to make them more applicable to what i was doing and um no there's nothing bigger than that Mm -hmm. honestly emotionally if you get good at it if you're just doing it if it's hypothetical and you're not practiced up then it'll shatter, right? You'll think you're getting there. And Mm. then when you step in the start gate, all of a sudden everything gets quiet and you realize, you know, your brain snaps back to where you are and you don't have the discipline to keep it where it belongs. Mm -hmm. The reality is any, any kind of movement, whether it's military or athletics or business, you only have what you have, right? Your, your body, it has a skill set. Either you've prepared well or you haven't, you know, all you can ask is on the day that you're asked to compete or do do your your task that your brain doesn't get in the way and screw it up Mm -hmm. that's really all you have i mean to try to do something um at your best level that's that's pretty much in my mind the best way to do it so i was just removing my brain from the situation and letting my muscle memory and tactics and everything else do its best and um it never it never really had i i did try it um at various i had different things it was an evolution of um, you know, arousal control, trying to getting too fired up and just detonating in races like too right hot. away. Yeah, yeah. Just and then figuring out the balance, figuring out which which mental movie or story to be playing for which races, for which scenario. Um 
and that that took a long time. I had a whole you know bunch of books that I'd written all these out and just added detail. The more detail you have, the better you immerse yourself in it. And you know, versus method acting for those actors who kind of lose their brain a lot of times doing it. I wasn't playing two different characters. It was always me. I was always the character, which is, I think, a really nice way to do it. But That's I just there was just a bunch of different scenarios that caused different reactions. So, um, but they are traumatic. And ultimately, I stopped doing it because it was too traumatic. I mean, I'd essentially put myself or my family or people I knew or, you know, in, in, in life or death situations and made it so real that it was as real as if it had actually happened. I did it hundreds and hundreds, thousands of times. And it was too, it was too much of a burden emotionally for me. Like it was just like, I could feel that it was just cooking me. Yeah. (laughs) Um, That's intense. But, um, but then I moved on to, to sort of different, couple different paths of the same kind of concept that I think were, equally viable, but probably not even accessible earlier. I kind of had to go through that part before I could get to the the later stuff. And that was sort of surrendering to the, the group mentality and Mm. not only the same thing, it only worked in certain situations, but there was a time and I I did a a TEDx talk on it, um, loosely a few years ago, but in 2003 world championships in St. Moritz. And I, I I hadn't I'd done what I was normally doing so I I played the you know the story in my head and and had an unbelievable performance like you know I I'd blown I'd blown in the downhill I had wind and it was minus 25 everybody had wicked frostbite and um I was just unlucky I was way out and then made a crazy comeback in the slalom runs which was a miracle cuz my equipment was garbage and I wasn't mm. skiing that good at that time but made this two incredible runs um maxing out like this everything worked right like i had the right story fully immersed in it body did exactly what it was supposed to do and and was down the finish but there was still like i mean i was so far behind there was still like 10 or 15 guys who were all way ahead of me after the first even the first round of the slalom so there were three plus seconds ahead of me after the downhill and then last after the first round of slalom and i'm in the finish leading and but at that time i was the up and coming guy i hadn't had any you know, my 06, like where everybody hated me in the U S yet. And world championships isn't big in the U S but it's huge in Europe. And there was, we're talking millions and millions of people who, you know, were watching and were cheering and, you know, they're pretty passionate over there. It's a bit like soccer or or football here, you know, where people are really into into it. it. And whereas the Austrians, pretty much only the Austrians want them to win and the Swiss, only the Swiss want them to win. And the Swiss want the Austrians to lose badly and vice versa. And all those central European countries are all kind of in the same boat as well as Norwegians. Yeah. But because I was an American and because my style was different and my personality was kind of different, I was kind of supported by all of them. So I had Mm. the, I had, I had a much bigger overall support than any other racer in the race. And, um, I was in the finish and just kind of was, in that mindset where I didn't let myself completely come out of that sort of trance that you're in when you're, and then even afterwards, a lot of times there's a really big emotional kind of like dip when you've already put yourself through that traumatic experience that got your body to that level and sort of arousal state. And then I was sort of still in that. And I was just kind of like in the zone, I kept feeling these like waves of like, I don't know, I only can describe it as like energy basically Hmm. as the guys were coming down. And it was, my interpretation is essentially it was like, you know, slowing them down. It was like every wanted me to win. There was by far the most people watching, whether it was TV or in person, wanted me to win, wanted them to come down just behind me. And it started happening. And it's a bit like a run in basketball or something else where, you know, the crowd starts to be a Tiger Woods, a great example. Like he was so good. But if you tried to explain his phenomenal shots or these comebacks or these moments, through logic alone, you you're the likelihood of those happening are like way less than winning the mega bucks. Like you can't it just, make it up. statistically you just, yeah, you couldn't do it. So yeah. there has to be something else there. And I'm not really a religious person, but I do understand energy and sort of the way things work. And you get enough people all putting their energy into one thing and it compounds the fact. And then the athlete just has to not fuck it up essentially. And like That's not insane. let fear get in the way. And I watched it happen. And ultimately after it's like three, almost four minutes of racing between the downhill and the two slalom runs. And I was more than three seconds behind after the downhill. And it was seven hundredths to second place and seventeen hundredths to third place and twenty one hundredths to fourth place. 
and I ended up winning. And the guys were lo- like, you watched it in the last four gates. It was like guys were going through like thicker Shock. air than they, <laughs> they couldn't get to the finish. It was like one guy had like a huge lead still at the last split and didn't make any mistakes and totally unexplainably was just behind me. And it was like, so that kind of opened my brain up to, to that side of it instead of like, if you can generate the right, the right environment. And I think things like the Olympics are a great example of that, where if you have the right personality, you express yourself the right way, you have that opportunity there, but then you'd have to almost surrender yourself to it. And whereas that was the other side of it, like it wasn't me. I, yeah, I didn't, it either anything. affected me or it didn't. Either way, I wasn't plugged into it. I was taking responsibility myself, but I felt that impact on everyone else. It was the negative side of it. Whereas mm-hmm. in the Olympics in 2010, which keep in mind is seven years later, it's after a whole bunch of shit. I'd gone independent, I'd quit, I'd come back and um, I wasn't fit. I wasn't ready to race. Um, but I was like, I want to do it once where I'm that guy where like I let the cumulative sort of program instead of I'll remove my brain, same thing, but I'm not going to run the story. I'm just going to like, cause I had the skill set to take my brain out of play. I could just zone out and like blow, yeah. almost like my eyes are blurry, but they're sharp, but you're not connecting. The, <laughs> nothing's Thousand going on there. Stare, yeah. It's just your body able to do what it does. And I was like, I'll just, I'm like the automaton and the group, the, the cumulative group feel is who's going to be dr- driving the c- control stick essentially. And that was a great example of it was with the, first, the time where I won gold because I was same thing way behind after the event that I should have been winning. At. I won the training runs and was killing guys. And then I just had a shitty run and was way back and had to do a slalom run where my slalom was super rickety at that point. Like I hadn't, yeah. I hadn't been anywhere near the front in slalom and forever. My equipment was horrible. My boots were garbage. Um, <laughs> and uh and I did that. I just zoned out. My my technician was like freaking out because he'd never seen me really like that before where I was just like, it was literally like out of body. Like I was not in, in there and he was like, he could see it and he was like, are you okay? dude?" And I was Jeez. like, I was like, I'm trying something. We'll see. And I did. And it was like, there was an into hairpin, which is a really annoying thing to set in the Olympics. It's actually what made Axel blow out hmm. um, at the bottom, right before the finish where a hairpin is normally, it's two vertical gates. So gates are normally an inside and outside, and you only ski around the inside, but the outside gate represents a line that you have to cross. Hmm. So you you would only think of it as like, you're skiing this way and that way. These outside gates don't matter, but they're always there. And a hairpin is where they turn one vertical and the other vertical. So you have to cross these two lines, even though they're, they're, we're like this, you just turn them like that. And normally guys, ski in this way and they they ski across that line and these two gates these are spread out and these two are really close together so you you see it as like a guy might hit this gate hit the outside gate of the same turn if it was this way hit the inside gate of the next turn and never touch the outside gate of that turn so it's a one two and out Out. but they set it as an into so that's how we all ski them since you're little that's the normal way to do it this one guy uh anti costelich loves fucking with guys and <laughs> at the Olympics and yeah, at the Olympics and he's setting into, so this gates out of play and you have to ski around the bottom gate to get this way. So you ski, everyone sees this and they think, okay, I got to like get over this gate. And even if they don't, they go in this way and they think they ski this way and out that way Wrong instead way. of the, around the bottom gate. It's just like in that moment where everything is as quick as it is in slalom, it was just a really gnarly thing to do. And we all inspect and we all see it. But in that moment, there's so much muscle memory and routine. Oh, man. And I was like, I wonder if, I mean, no one watching is going to know that that, that and no one knows what an into is and would even know it's a cadence. There's a whole, like you have this quick, like, I mean, it's, it's fast. So yeah. you have to like, it's all reactionary. And I didn't even, I like, I remember coming over the last pitches, just kind of watching myself. It's almost like those video games where you can be like first person where you're looking out your own eyes or like back. Yeah. And it was like, I was back. That's how far removed I was. And I like, wasn't feeling fatigue. I wasn't feeling the gates hit my arms. I could hear the sound and see it, but that was it. And I skied straight through like super clean, like not even a bad, I just do, 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 do. And then Axel was like a little few behind me. Um, had a, a big lead and he had won the downhill part and he came down and the same thing and I was watching and I was like, oh God, like I'm so <laughs> glad that I wasn't driving the ship 
when that happened. Cause even coming into it, I could see he was thinking about it already. He was like, okay, it's an into, and like his cadence got all fucked up and he spazzed out and hooked a tip and oh, was out man. like four gates from the finish. He wouldn't have won anyway, but he would have been second or third and he was so bummed, but it was, uh, that was the one that was like the best time where I got to really experience the positive side of it, where it was like, it was next level of, I guess, like that concept of mental toughness. Cause that's what it was. It was, I, it was the most demanding thing I've ever done yeah. was to try to take myself out and like surrender control in that environment with that much on the line and keep it there. Like it's so easy Give to like relax your brain and like you'll snap back and like you're in the Olympics. Like it wasn't like confusing. There's fucking people everywhere. <laughs> and like it was a, it was, it was awesome to do. I mean, th those are the things that I would say I'm the most proud of because they were the most challenging and they're the most unique. Those are things that probably there's not that many people who could do, you know, or I don't know how many, maybe more people could do it if they had the right lead up, but my yeah. lead up was so unique that it's hard for me personally to see a path to where I ended up to show someone else. Yeah. How to it's do like, it. it required, it was a lifetime of shit that like had to go exactly how it went to were get you, there. Were you figuring all that out on your own or did, were coaches helping you with those no. mindset yeah, techniques? Yeah, it was on my own. I mean, I, I talked to people about it all the time, but it was mostly like, you'd see their eyes glass <laughs> over after about <laughs> five seconds. They're like the what? And I'd be like, eh, never mind. <laughs> we'll get back to it. But um, but there was a lot of really valuable stuff that I had lots of conversations with my teammates and with coaches about. There were sort of intermediary steps that I'd come across that I thought were more suitable for most of the guys. And we did a bunch of stuff. And we had a, we had a really amazing series. I mean, when I was on the team, it wasn't just that I was winning. Everybody likes to attribute it like, oh, one guy's doing it, so the other guys believe. And then it was other stuff, too. There was a lot of actual tangible things that we were doing that made the guys able to compete at their highest level better than they had as a team before that not those guys but the team itself yeah we've always had amazing racers we just don't have anyone who can compete at their highest level consistently on world cup you take them down a level to norams and they'll beat they'll world crush. cup guys all day they smash guys the but pressure. then yeah the pressure they're just not adapted to it and we did a bunch of stuff with sort of irrational fear versus you know, danger. And, um, you know, I love that the Will Smith from after earth where he's like, fear is a choice and danger is real. There's like, he goes on a whole monologue and it was like, he was, he climbed inside my head and was like <laughs> stealing it. I was going to call him up for <laughs> plagiarism, but I'm um, sure it's been talked about before I came up with it. But that was like a huge part of it for me was irrational fears. I think they have a weird way of worming their way into your head and fucking with you and all sorts of stuff. So if you ever discover one, you got to address it right away. It's even if it seems totally disconnected from anything else you care about or whatever, if you're afraid of, you know, whatever, some yeah, the innocuous spider or you're afraid of whatever it is, if you address that, it tends to like, it weakens your brain's ability to blow fear out of proportion Bring another and, one and, and it just adds a, a weapon to your mental arsenal. So did your, did your parents intentionally raise you like that to build mindsets like you have developed or were they just kind of winging it out in the woods? In I mean, I think every parent's just winging it. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were, they were pretty conscious of it in a lot of ways. I mean, they definitely wanted to move into the woods. My dad was third year medical school, came from his dad as a doctor, his two older brothers are doctors. He was just rebelling. I think, you know, he spoke at Woodstock. He was pretty active in the sixties. Um, they just wanted that counterculture lifestyle. I don't think they were thinking of like what it would mean developing a skill set so much as just a way to raise kids who are different or experience the world differently. Um, I think that was sort of their thought, but you'd have to ask them and they're, I've asked them, they're pretty all over the place. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was lucky. I got good parents, but they, they're definitely different. They're they're a bit crazy. It was the opposite of like the helicopter parents that we have yeah. going on now. Yeah, the opposite. Yeah, you couldn't get further further apart. Um, and the same with competition. Like my dad, you know, even after I'd like, you know, won stuff, the Olympics or, you know, medals and all that, he was like, I just hope you're happy. I hope you're not doing this for, for me or somebody else. I was like, yeah, dad, that's, that ship has sailed, dude. You know, that's, not, that's not a problem right now. That is fascinating. Did you ever go through a stage where mentally you kind of hit 
rock bottom with your mindset mindset and how to rebuild? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it happens. It's cyclical. It happens all the time, but you know, they're different. It's all relative to where you are in your, your overall development and, you know, your life and all sorts of other things come into play. But, um, I had a bunch of them. I mean, if you, if you were to track it, like Mm -hmm. internally, if you had some way, it's a, it's a rocky road externally. I think I was always pretty steady. Um, but I think that's also something I discovered early is that one influences the other. Like you can be mentally really tough and that impacts your physical state. And then conversely, you can be a mental basket case, but if physically you kind of keep your shit together and, and you know, not fake it till you make it, but it's sort of like you keep going, you know, the mind body. Yeah. Then it does the, it it affects your mind, you know, the, the inverse. So, um, yeah, when I was, when I was 12, I had a really rough, rough time. And that was particularly poignant because I was so young and, you know, was in that really, I would say like, um, susceptible phase to like pessimism or, you know, politics, negative shit. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'd, I'd been second in a race and one race over, it was individual races in the same day. So second one and first and the other one that qualified me for the junior Olympics. So I was psyched. I mean, I, it was the first chance I'd had. I was a J three. It was the first chance I really had to go to the junior Olympics. And like, that's how you got sponsors. It's how you got into boarding schools like Burke or Carabasset or wherever. And, mm-hmm. um, it was an important thing. Plus it was like my life and it's what I cared about and was all fired up for it. And, Went through a race, another five or six races throughout the next, you know, month or so. And then they announced the team. Um, everyone's there. It's the whole, you know, it's after the final race. It's kind of like before the Junior Olympics. And they announced the team. I'm not on. I should have been like second or th- whatever. There's one kid who was ahead of me um, who'd won two races. And uh, I wasn't on it. And then they announced the the uh, uh, invitationals, which is like the next. It's like the, the reje- yeah. rejects <laughs> one. Um and I was like third for that one. And my uncle was there and my mom was there. Um, some friends, of my grandparents were there and they were all like, what the hell? Like we were at the race. We have the, like, what's going what's on? Going we went on? up and they were like, oh, your coach, this guy, Walter Brown, who I'd had a bunch of those conversations I was just telling about. <laughs> um, he, he called, he, t- he told the, the race engineer afterwards that you hooked a tip and that you told him and that you wanted to be disqualified because you felt bad about it. And um, it's completely fabricated and, and, he made that up. Yeah, he Crazy. just totally made it up to fuck me over. And they were like, there's nothing we can do about it. Sorry. No way. And, yeah. And uh, I was like, but the gatekeepers all like have their gate cards. Like that's how it happens. If there's not an official protest, there's a whole system. He was like, yeah, we just made the exception on that case because it was your coach and whatever. And I was like, and I, you know, obviously I still didn't, I didn't, I don't freak out. I don't, you know, I just like went inter- I went internal but I was super pissed and was sad and depressed and like, and then petulant you get like, fuck everybody, you know, like, fuck this, this is stupid. Like, you know, I don't want to be doing this and went through like, you know, that all in a really quick succession. And then I had probably like a week and a half until the invitationals. And I was like, I'm not fucking going to that. Like I should be at the junior Olympics, like competing to try to like, nobody even pays attention. You could win everything at, at the invitationals and nobody's watching that shit. Like yeah. you're already below the top, you know, 60 or 80 guys in, in the tiny little age group in the East coast. And, um, and I talked to my grandmother about it a little bit. She was pretty late into cancer at that time, but she was still, um, you know, super sharp. And, and she was like, you know, you already know this, but you can't control that shit. Like, it's just not gonna, like, you think this is the last time you're gonna get fucked over, you're crazy. Like, it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen as often as anybody else has the motivation and the opportunity to do it. You People know, are gonna come that's after it. You. It's just, it's the way it works. And it gets worse as you get further up. Like, right now, you're just, this just so happened to be your coach who was a dick and had an opportunity and it worked, you know? Mm-hmm. And she was like, you can't control that. All you can do, and like, you know, you're still bent right now, and I was on, the reality of that little moment, like that, that was going to matter. And I had a good reason too, because that was how you develop scholarships into these academy. It was real. I mean, it did have a tangible impact on stuff. It wasn't just me being dramatic. It was like going to be annoying and it was a pain in the ass. Um, even just making the junior Olympics would have been, I would have been on the radar of academies and had an opportunity. Yeah. And, uh, but she was like, you, you still need to be thinking of like 
every chance you get, all you can really do is every chance you get, every opportunity you get, every scenario is just trying to kick as much ass in that and prepare by trying to kick as much ass in the preparation as you can. Like, just think of it that way. Like your job is to kick ass as often as many minutes per day or as many seconds per minute as often as you can leading up to these opportunities where then you try to kick ass in the opportunity that you're given. Just if the opportunity is less than what you want, bitch about it if you want to, but all you're doing is wasting time that you should be trying to kick ass at the things. Like it's, they, they don't work at the same time. You can't be bitching and maximizing. Those yeah. two are literally, they correlate conversely. And like you, and I was, it resonated with me and I was like, all right, that, that was being kind of a, a whiny bitch That's about That's good it. wisdom and at then, that age though. And then, so I went to Junior Olympics, did fine. Or I mean, the Invitationals did fine. And then the two people who are with me, uh, my grandparents' friends, helped to get me into a, a ski academy the next year. And you know, it wasn't scholarship, really. I had to pay and had to live as a day student. It was fucking brutal. But Different that plan. that phase was like, that was like a low. And it was pretty quick, the return. But even at the at the Invitationals, like I didn't, it was still there. Like I still was dealing with it and still wasn't like where I should have been mentally and and in it, I was kind of like, fuck this, you know, yeah. but at least I understood that part of what she'd said. And then, um, yeah, unfortunately that was that same type of scenario, you know, not getting screwed over specifically, but like having those kind of call them like injustice or like, you know, you go into a victim mindset for mm -hmm. a bit, um, you know, feeling bad for yourself or whatever it, those happened. Yeah. Really throughout in the next, you know, 15 or 20, 20 years. You just got um, better at handling them. Yeah, I got better time. at handling them in the, in internally, I got much better at handling them externally. I think, um, I didn't really improve much, but you know, then after 06 where I kind of, that was another cratering, like a rock bottom thing. And that was where I got better at the external part. I think I had, a, and it, it's probably one of the things that makes it harder for me personally is that I tend to, bank a huge catalog of information and, and experience and not really get to utilize it effectively or not like incrementally improve until like a thing is a catalyst. And then I can sort of reassess everything and then integrate and then move forward from like, I have like big jumps in yeah. like in certain areas, especially mentally or, or, um, politically, you know, yeah. dealing with authority or dealing with, um, those sort of hierarchical systems that are, tough to manage. I mean, no one's really born in, into that unless you're born into like the, the royal family or whatever and you are raised with it. But I was re literally raised like, on, uh, you know, by wolves and the like, opposite, yeah. it's not the same at all. So that was a really challenging thing. Cause like, I'd always like, it would literally like, I'd be making the same stupid mistakes or saying the wrong shit and like getting myself into trouble. And then, and then I'd kind of recognize it and make a huge leap and then like be better for a little while and then deal with more shit. And then like another huge leap. And, um, those are it's rough in hindsight when you see that because you just put yourself through so much worse shit than you could have had Make you just made like tiny different decisions. But yeah, so all that all that experience and then now fast forwarding to to more current events, the the mindset you've had you have and the experiences you've gone through, and then you've gone into more adversity, just fairly recently something that you've been pretty public about and talked about with the loss of your child to a drowning accident. How did, how did you personally navigate through that traumatic event? I mean, that's an event that would devastate a lot of families. I know personally, like it's one that you look at and wonder if you could get out of, I mean, how did you, how did you work through that situation? Um, I mean, I, without, without sort of lessening the, the severity of it, um, I was really well equipped to deal with it mm -hmm. because of all the stuff we've just talked about. Like I really had dealt with trauma, severe trauma, as real as I could make it. If I figured out any way, or if I thought there was a way to make it more severe, I didn't have kids at that time. Otherwise, you can damn well be sure that my kids would have been a part of those stories, right? Like as a father, saving your kids from something or whatever is like a tool. It's a, it's a resource that you have that can tap into emotion and power um, that's probably as big as anything in life. So, but at that time, I only had really sisters, brothers, um, family, 
you know, made up stuff, but that's all I did. I just made it as severe and gnarly as I could and then created the environment to get the most out of myself. So in that sense, I'd been training for 25 years to deal with exactly that. Of course, in my imagination, it comes out better at the end. Yeah, <laughs> And a- this was the same all the way up, except it came out the worst case scenario. So, you know, there's, there's a difference there, but the reality is it's not as different as you'd think. It was simply following through on the whole story without the happy ending, you know? So, you know, you, I did everything. I was prepared mentally, emotionally to do it. And then all you have to do is figure out how to let time go by. Cause mm. it really doesn't get less. I mean, it's severe. It's, it's gnarly. We're not, nobody is lucky as some people are get out of life without losing people they love or, Close to you know, them. dealing with severe stuff that way. It's just the nature of being alive. Um, but time is what normalizes that you need chronological time to pass and like when it first happens shit just goes completely sideways like you lose track of stuff you like we weren't eating we like your brain wants to stay in that moment chronologically somehow even though it's not possible like time's passing but emotionally and everything else you stick to that day what's there and that was i think again i was uniquely equipped to because i've dealt with chronological time versus emotional time and all that for so long that i really just like doing things that are manual, things that are physical, same thing. Like my mind couldn't do anything, but physically I could do stuff. And we had all of our kids still, you know, Mm -hmm. the ones um, that wanted life to go on and that needed stuff. So I just really kind of tried to help my wife manage that part of it, like being physical, doing things, being up, moving around, you know, doing projects, doing activities and making sure that you were at least giving your brain that chance to try to like latch on it can't help it your brain has to go with you at least a little bit even though part of it was still wants to stay um it's when you just stagnate that it gets really problematic if you're not um, moving which forward. is the natural reaction unfortunately we're poorly designed for that like it just everything in you is telling you just don't move you just like want to just sit still and not do anything mm-hmm. um so it was it was a process because I'd never gone through it before. So like kind of applying, but the same kind of thing I was just talking about, like I had this backlog of skills that I'd never applied to that specifically, but they were there. I dealt with the same thing of like in, in, you know, obviously I talked about severity being different, but the Olympics, I mean, think Oh six, I was supposed to win five events. I didn't really have a great chance to in reality, but everyone assumed I was, and I came out with nothing. Right. So same thing. I'd done this whole build up. I'd trained, I'd busted my ass. I was prepared and then came out with nothing. So while it's different, it's on a global stage and it's it has real event. material impacts. And if you've been spending your whole life at that, that's enough that would put a lot of athletes completely into in depression. Hole. And yeah, like, and yeah, I was, it was awful, but I'd pulled myself out of that as well. So I kind of like, I had this skill set that I'd never had to apply to that specifically to a family environment, to losing a child, to whatever, but I could go back through. And that also was useful for my brain to go back and recycle all this stuff and try to extract meaningful stuff, things, skills that I could maybe apply, how to modify those, how to do different stuff that would, that would help my family, my kids and my wife and, you know, surrounding, surrounding people who are all suffering Mm -hmm. um try to like move everybody kind of forward and um it was it was tough i mean it's it's it was a tough period but um yeah it was it was i think like i said i was pretty pretty happy that i'd had the life that i had before that because i don't think i would still be married had i not i don't i don't know how someone who didn't have some of the skill at least some of the skills that i have um, could manage that because it's there's so much that's counterintuitive. There's so much that's instinctually power, powerful that just shuts you down. And if you didn't know how to manage that, you just I don't know what you do. I think you just starve yourself to death or end up in the hospital with something else. Yeah. Do you think the focus because you guys made a big focus on helping other parents prevent possibly going through a similar situation? Do you think kind of that focus on others helped you get through that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're all part of it. There's, there's hundreds of different micro components that you try to put together that all, um, all try to, you know, it's part of it. Like I said, it's 
it's mostly just about chronological time because that's what you need to normalize anything. It just takes time. Same with working out, same with anything. Mm -hmm. um, but but there's also a natural uh, human obligation that my wife and I both share about trying to be a positive force, right? Like it's just kind of, it's a, it's a basic, I think, decision that we all have to make is how often and how seriously do you take trying to be a positive force when you look around and you see all the shit that goes on and like how many people are not doing that and you have the brain that can decide to or not. Um, I mean, that's a that's a tiny little emotional feel good thing that kind of can offset some of the suffering. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also just a basic human um, obligation, I think. So it was it was definitely helpful along with a million other things. But um, I think even if I didn't believe it was helpful, I think for me personally, I think I would have done it just because, yeah, it's a, it's a good do thing good. to do. With your unique uh, upbringing, what is your guys's parenting philosophies look like now with all your kids. How many kids do you have at home right now? We have six here. My daughter, my oldest daughter's down in California. Okay. Um, she plays softball and um yeah, it's it's hard to say. I don't I don't know that it's easy to <laughs> to um put a label on a parenting style. I would say shit show is probably the, <laughs> the most applicable, but I don't know that that really is defines that much. It's we try to give them freedom. My wife grew up very differently than I did, so it's always an amalgamation between you know parents. You, you do what you can in yeah, terms of balance, but she's certainly not going to let me run things how I want to. Um, and I'm sure I, I don't let her run how she wants to. So, <laughs> you know, she grew up in Orange County. You know, scheduled C sections. We were home birthed. All of us. My mom was a midwife. Um, so we we couldn't really be further apart socioeconomically, geographically. Um, Opposite. Yeah. But, you know, we have we have the advantage of having a bunch of kids. They kind of, you know, they outnumber us so severely that it's kind of like they raise themselves in a way. They dictate so much of how they're raised. And it's only so much you can do, you know, when you're outnumbered like that. <laughs> you're kind of along for the ride. So, you know, we try to, I think we're we're pretty aligned on on the, you know, the honor codes that we impart on them, sort of the basic fundamentals of being a good person and that stuff. But, um, you know, we have five boys and they like to kick the shit out of each other and they're, they're tough. It's a bit, it's a bit different than how I grew up where I had solitude and I had nature. And I mean, I, I was telling my son the other day, there was one time where I was, came in cause tennis camp had ended and it was like a constant, um, entertainment area you know 50 kids playing tennis playing every different sport just screwing around all the time and it, it ended and then i'm left there by myself like with nobody and Nothing. my little brother's you know two years old i'm like i can't do shit with him he <laughs> just sits there and my sisters are girls and they were you know into girl stuff and she my mom was like go out and look at the river and i was like like any seven-year-old was like fuck look at there what are you talking about like <laughs> I want something to do. I yeah. want to like go play tennis or do something. And she's, there's just no one around. I mean, I'm in a place where there, our town mm -hmm. is 600 people. And no, you know, everyone's in school or whatever. So I just went out and sat by the river and was like, all right, I'm going to sit here and look at the river. And, and she said, I sat there for a couple hours, literally like just sitting there looking and the water is incredible. That it's way. incredible. It's, yeah. When you see, we had a little brook, you know, and it's like, you get all the different light and you have, there's leaves that come by and there's, you know, you'll see little bugs and fish. And it's just, I think, I guess what I was getting at is that like you, there's certain things you can give a kid that if they're receptive to it, they can be really game changing. And I mm -hmm. think we're constantly trying to keep our eyes open for those, um, opportunities to give them that. Because I that was huge for me, but I didn't have four brothers. They were always fucking taking my shit or you know battling one way or the other. He, like they're dealing with the school element already. It's you, different. Yeah, yeah, they're already in a hierarchy. They're already all trying to out alpha the other ones. And so for me, trying to give them time alone or like those moments where they can kind of disconnect as often as I can um, is is big. But like I said, the reality is when you have that many, they just kind of run the show. Yeah. Try to keep them fed and keep them safe as much as you can, but <laughs> keep I don't, them know, alive. I don't know that it works. It's a big difference now, though, because the kid getting bored nowadays, going to the parent looking for something to do, usually 
typically the answer is like a phone or a tablet. And so they're not getting that solitude at all. They're getting the complete Hyper opposite. stimulation. Yeah, which is uh, playing out as an interesting dynamic, something that we haven't seen before. Yeah, it's going to be messy in the next. This generation, I think, is going to have the worst of it. Because I think it'll change within this generation, probably. There will mm-hmm. be something that's got to happen because it's, it's not just the kids, it's adults too. I mean, mm-hmm. we're seeing, you know, I wouldn't say call it mass psychosis, but it's it's pretty damn close. Um, delusion and, you know, zero ability to like the, the opposite of self-reliance. Like everything needs to be fed, but it's like there's no trusted sources. There's no, no one can think for themselves and really be critical mm-hmm. in, in a logical way without like backup, you know, without, without a mob mentality, like it has to be, has to conform in some way to have any likelihood for, for most people to be able to think something. And that's, that's a weird thing to see, especially the way I grew up. Like I would say I'm very, um, far on the other end of the spectrum of having other people's shit affect me or the way I think about stuff and drives my wife crazy. Cause she's like, <laughs> you just think, you know, everything I'm like, <laughs> No, I'm convinced all the time of shit. Somebody's got to make a damn good argument because if I believe something, it's because I've thought it through. And if you bring new information to the table, I'm the first to be like, fuck yeah, that's way better. Mm -hmm. I believe that now. But I'm not just like... It's your thought. It's not easy to... Yeah, then it's mine too. And then you'd think I knew that too. It's like, (laughs) no, I didn't. I'll be the first to admit, just two minutes ago, I thought something (laughs) different. And now I've changed my mind. With more And now it is mine, and now I do own it. So going forward, you're going to think I know that too. But um, yeah, it's it's messy. I think it's it's sad because my kids are 100%. They were driving back from Salt Lake yesterday. You know, they're on their iPads in the car. Um, that's when we try to let them do it is planes or, or cars, um, long drives. But it is. It's, a, it's not a good phase that we're in right now. Not healthy, but... Yeah, it's interesting because the, the tech that we thought would do so much good and, and certainly is doing some good has also created like the highest anxiety rates of all time, the highest suicide rates of all time and the, the highest depression rates of all mm-hmm. time. And those are just the three monikers that are the most kind of tagline. There's a bunch of other shit underneath there that's, you know, equally as bad, mm-hmm. but just not talked about, not talked about as much. It's, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not good. Uh, I do want to shift on a more positive note and talk about another component of your life because you definitely are an entrepreneur and and have a a big business side of your life and your life story. Um, What's going on with Peak and what's the the concept behind Peak? And it is awesome that it's, you know, here in Montana close to us, but I know that you have some big plans there as well. Yeah, it's, it's, um, and I try to, as often as I can, I try to have things that are, have multiple prongs of motivation and, and success and, um, try to kill a couple birds with one stone <laughs> if I can. There's easy way. I've never really had a hard time making money. That's, hasn't been a, the biggest challenge for me. Um, but doing things that are really exciting and fun for me that are also positive for the country or the planet, um, is, is a little bit tougher, you know, to try to come up with things that are economically exciting and fun and successful and um, align on all fronts. And I think this was an easy one. I'd sort of been thinking about it for a lot of years. It wasn't until material science kind of caught up with where they needed to be, where it became viable. But, um, you know, I had so much experience building skis and in engineering and material science work that you know, I, I'm not formally educated. I only have a high school education, but um, I tend to retain information pretty well. And I had, um, you know, call it a, a mentorship or a, a trade school of, of life for a lot of years where I got to be around really sharp people who knew their business well. And um, I, I worked hard at that. So the idea is, is ultimately to change the manufacturing process. Um, I mean, skis have been manufactured the same way since the late 50s when Howard Head first started to build laminate skis. Um, And they're basically laid up. You lay up all these different layers with edges and base and fiberglass and wood and all that. 
and you put them in a press and you cook them under pressure. So you squish them real hard and cook them mm. and it, it melts glue or there's glue in, in there and it cures that glue. And then you take them out, cut off all the extra stuff and, and then let them dry. And, and there they are. And they don't, they, they're not recyclable because of that sort of the diversity of materials and, and, um, together. the glue, they're all stuck together and they're, because they're in snow, they're meant to be watertight and, so they'll sit in a landfill for 500 years. I mean, the edges will rust first, and then you know nothing else really breaks down that quick. Um, and they're they're really toxic. The glues, epoxies are are nasty. Um, but beyond that, there's also performance elements to it. There, there's only so much you can do when you deal with flat materials. You know, it's I always say it's maybe the easiest is like a bookshelf. If you have those little metal bracket book, bookshelves, yeah. If you took that material and you just had a flat piece and you just built made an L. It would just it would only support a couple books, and then it would just bend and fall down. Um, but you put that one ridge in the same material, you're just changing the mechanical advantage of that metal. You put that outward ridge that bridges that gap in between, and creates the angles. The force vectors are all pointing against the the uh, a thing turned this way versus this way, mm-hmm. and you can same metal, same material, but yet can support. 10 times, 20, 100 times as much. Yeah. And that's really difficult to do in skis with the current manufacturing process. So it was partly it was you couldn't use really cool new material. Material science has gone crazy in the last 20 years, right? Military, space, um, private stuff sector stuff. It's just, charge. yeah, it's, it's the foams, the thermoplastics, thermosets are nuts, but you can't really use them in the current manufacturing process. So my my sort of goal was to be able to build a ski that was 100% recyclable but not by using algae and <laughs> like that i wanted to <laughs> i wanted to use like people have been trying that that, that sucks like i, I want to build a ski that's much better and that's tunable so that i can really play with different characteristics the reality is i haven't been able to do the things i would want to do cuz you just couldn't do it the way they were built and it's no reason to build a one off that you you know I could spend five days probably building a pair of skis and test something, but if it's not scalable in any kind of way at all, it's right, not going to help. You're anyone. not. It doesn't help anything. You know, just be for my own knowledge. But um, I've done that a couple of times just to mess with it and test some theories. But the idea is to build a, a ski that has no glue, just sonic welded together. Because there's also processes like that, laser welding and sonic welding, essentially using sound or light to fuse two materials together at a molecular level. So you're basically like yeah you're squishing them together um and basically you can speed it up too right now press takes loosely 40 minutes from when you put a ski in and it goes down and cooks it and heats it up and keeps that pressure on there and then has to cool down and then comes out um and so i worked with this friend of mine over in germany who does automated manufacturing for you know the automobile industry you know, medical industry, everything, but they build everything globally. They're a crazy, awesome company. Um, and I, I had them do an engineering study and figured out that we can build skis on their machinery using, you know, thermosets and basically like high density polymers and foam. So we won't use wood. Um, but foams these days, there's like, you can have foam that is like this microphone or like your pillow at home or, foam that's like metal it's basically you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between they just they still call it foam but it's so dense and so compact um so you really have and anything in between you can rubberize it you can you can do anything you want all the options and it's really easy to recycle because of the nature of the molecular bonds there and the, the air inside is really what dictates its characteristics so um think of an, a ski where you just you have a base and edges that are sonic welded together and the edges are vertically stacked instead of laterally right now they sit on the base mm-hmm. and they kind of wiggle around because there's nothing really bad the sidewall is what backs them up on the top but um they'd be vertically stacked and then a layer of foam well a like a, a backer for the base so you can use a really thin base because bases are really bad too they're high fluorocarbon they're not good stuff bad you can recycle the them but they're bad for the environment and they're you can use really thin base and back it with urethane so that when you hit a rock, it just strips the base. It'll strip a – but the urethane won't won't dang. You'll just ski right over a rock. You wouldn't even – you won't face plant. It prevents injuries is really the purpose of that, but it solves other problems too. So you have really thin base, urethane backer, then foam, then one layer of shaped thermoplastic, so just stamped and 
or roll formed and basically it sits on you know the the foam is contoured to it so it sits right on that foam and you can dictate the torsional flex of this much of the tail because you put a different ridge in then that thermoplastic can get flat it'll bend much easier where it's flat you can invert those it'll bend one way but not the other way Hmm. you can put perforations in it so it'll twist to a point and then the perforations run out of room and they bump together and it won't bend anymore and you can change the thickness of it. You can do anything you want. Like wow. you can make a ski that does whatever you want and it'll be way lighter and then foam on the top and then cap it with these. Um, it's basically like a, it's like a plastic, but it's a, it's still a thermoset. Theoretically, it's, it's more of like a car. It's like carbon fiber, um, Kevlar rubber and like a plasticized combo. Yeah. And basically you can't ding it up. It would, last forever but it's also rigid enough and you cap it and sonic weld the sides and you can build a ski in about eight seconds no and it's clear. ready to ski right when it comes and it comes out com- perfect like zero deviation i mean the machines are 0.01 percent deviation and that's mostly just because of the materials but when you're dealing with raw materials like wood there's naturally going to be a huge variance but yep. if you're dealing with all these synthetic materials that are they're almost exactly the same all the time. And I mean, I mean that in an engineering sense, like for any <laughs> practical purposes, they are exactly the same. So you can build them eight seconds a pair and they go in in raw material. Some stuff's prefabbed on other machinery, but it comes into that machine raw material and goes into a box labeled to the customer. So eight seconds. That's so insane. you don't even need to deal with storage. You don't need to deal with overstock. You don't need to do with anyone can, you can get, you can get, 5,000 orders in a day and they're all shipped the same day or they're all in the boxes ready to be shipped the same day with no, you don't stock any materials, you know, or you stock your materials, but you don't stock any actual finished product. And the ultimate goal is to be a manufacturer for the main players globally. So other I don't really want to have 500,000 customers or 5 million customers. It's just, you don't customer services, <laughs> as you can imagine, not appealing to me, but, um, because nobody else can really do this they don't know how and they don't they're already they're amortizing their old shitty material and products and facilities and and machinery um they don't really want to mess with it Mm -hmm. but if you come in and say we can build your skis better than you can i'll show you and we'll save you 20 bucks a pair that 20 dollars translates directly to their bottom line because nothing else changes same sales channel same everything they just don't pay as much plus they can divest of all that shit so they can sell or get rid of Lots you know of risk stuff. and overhead um and we can you know we can still be collecting eighty dollars a pair and we can be making you know we'll have five or six seven ten customers and um be building four million pairs of skis and be collecting between fifty and a hundred dollars a pair that's wild. so it becomes a pretty pretty powerful company economically and then sell it right away before <laughs> somebody else copies us and makes us obsolete. Um, Are you the only one manufacturing skis like that right now? Yeah, we're not doing it right now. The machinery, they did the engineering study, which is essentially building the machine to do it. They they don't do it theoretically. They have to, They we I work with them and figure out exactly how to do it, which parts of their machinery does which things, but we don't have the machine yet and they're not producing skis on it yet. But they did the engineering study to make sure that their machinery can take raw materials and do all the steps in between and execute. And wow. that's proven out. So that that was a huge part of it because it had as much as you can think it can work until you actually go through the whole engineering study and make sure that every step is taken care of. Because even in that process, you can't have one step where a human has to step in and dick around with something because it fucks up the whole thing. Like, <laughs> yeah. At that point, adding five seconds is, you know, is catastrophic. It's be so perfect. It has to work all the way through. Um, but yeah, it should be, I'm hoping we get it next summer machine over here and we'll have one in Europe too. And yeah, we're the only ones by far. I mean, they all these other companies think they're automating or thinking they're doing stuff, and they're like, they're automating moving a ski from one shitty machine to the other. It just now has a little Robot conveyor arm. that rolls over, and they're like, "Yes, we've automated." I'm like, "No, dude, you're trying to change." You guys the are whole on the game. wrong fucking path. But yeah. I've been saying that for 20 years, so it's time to stop bitching about it. And just do it. That's the, the way your mind works, though. Just try to to reinvent something with a better way. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's awesome. And ideally. Like I said, if it solves multiple things, that's that's better because it's this. I mean, we'll be able to we'll, I think we'll eventually it'll be hard for us to control it unless we keep the company for, you know, I don't know, at least seven, 10 years. But 
I want to drive the price way down. I think it's it's obnoxious that we charge so much for skis, but you have to. I mean, those those companies aren't rolling in it. The hard goods side of ski business, mm -hmm. they do single digits um, of EBITDA profitability. They're like one two percent on average, which is horrendous. Yeah. No one would ever go into a business where your margins are one two percent because then a bad year they get absolutely smashed. Like yeah. they're they're losing money hand over fist. That's why those companies trade for such shitty. Mar you know, they have no multiples. They basically trade. Off Flat. of not even certainly not top line revenue, they trade off of some way lower multiple because you risk losing money on it, and there's no way they can fudge that and make it look like you don't risk losing money if you buy them for their top line revenue. You're a hundred percent going to lose money the next year if you bought them on that. So yeah. they have to buy them on some weird metric way down below there. That's an opportunity possibly that we might, if if it all works well, is just to buy. Buy because they don't trade on shit and they're not worth much. You can yeah. buy them, leave then everything else the same, and just skis. produce those skis. Leave everything else the same, and then sell them back. You know, at a huge multiple. Because if you're doing, even if you just, if we're if we're able to build skis for about fifty dollars a pair right now, we buy our skis from Milan for two hundred and seventeen dollars a pair. So, and we still make good margins on ours because we're direct consumer all mm -hmm. these other companies go through a distributor and then Retail. all the way through that chain and everybody takes a piece so they might build a pair for 170 right now and that's like bottom cheap like that's fisher head and they might sell it to a distributor for 250 so they're making 100 bucks a pair but they have all this other unconnected that's not it's just cost of goods they have all their infrastructure above there that still costs some money it's so if we can take that chain. if we can take that down and they're making the same. We could drop that down by one hundred and twenty dollars. So you're you're doubling their margins. If you take a company that's doing a billion dollars in top line and you double their margins, it moves the whole company forward and changes the whole industry, which is good. Yeah, and then you're not fishing out of the same supply chain too, because that's a shit show right now. Like everybody buys the same stuff: wood, fiberglass, and it's all bad stuff. The production of it's bad. In this case, once you once you took over that space, you can take people's skis back from the year before and give them a new pair for two hundred and twenty bucks. The recycle. And you're old still ones. making a bunch of money because you just take the old ski, you sonic cut it, same machine. You just put it back in. It just cuts in, the whole thing falls apart. Foam, thermoplastic, foam. Only thing that's stuck together is the base edge, but you can you can cut that too. There's always you have to have intermediary materials between like really disparate materials like a base is squishy rubber and an edge is steel. They don't like to go together. So you have intermediary materials in there and that's like tiny, tiny little layer of a softer metal, like a copper, and then maybe even some thermoset in there so that they can all play together. Mm -hmm. So when you cut that, those all become functional. They Inevitably, they have a split point. They do it on their own. How, when you sonic weld it, it just says, okay, this is the weakest point and that's when they come apart and then you reuse that same thing. You just put it right back. That's awesome. Um, but it'll be, if we could take over enough, then it becomes basically sustainable because you still do have, you have to add new materials here and there, but steel is is an easy one. I mean, who has virgin steel these days, you know? Yeah. Basically everything is remelted and broken down, repurposed and reused for different industries. It's only, I don't know who does it, mattresses maybe. They like virgin steel springs. <laughs> <laughs> They're like straight mined out of the ground, but um, it'll it'll change a lot of that, which is I think really positive. That's amazing. You're still pushing hard. Yeah, that fits into the five percent <laughs> of the time where I'm not managing my kids and wife. <laughs> um, time management's the big challenge for me. Time management, sleep. Yeah, yeah. My stupid watch keeps telling me if I, if I get above fifty percent <laughs> on my sleep score, I'm like, yes, it's a good day. It literally, my, you're like your battery, your body battery started today at twenty seven, and you've used eighty four. I'm like. Is that bad? Am I dead? <laughs> Am I dead yet? <laughs> it seems like I'm dead. Um, I don't listen to my watch that much. Yeah, those things you got to be careful with because you got you got a lot of stuff to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to manage. But well, thanks for swinging by the lab. We're we're stoked that you're here, and um, thanks for coming by. Proud of all the stuff you've done. It's amazing. Thank you. Your, your mindset stuff super interesting. No, I look forward to doing some stuff with you guys. I think it'll be really good. Likewise. Thanks, Bodie. Appreciate it. <laughs>